Good morning, Eastridge Chapel class. Uh, I want to welcome you to a very weird, different, unique, I guess, version of our, our chapel class uh, Corona series videos. Um, this one's weird because I hadn't planned on doing one this week. And the reason I hadn't planned on doing one this week is, as you may know, I am preaching this morning. Uh, the, the task of putting together the sermon and then coordinating with all the people and then doing it, like there's a whole bunch of new stuff on my schedule this week because I'm preaching that aren't normally on my schedule. So I had planned to not do a, um, a this. Uh, but it's Friday afternoon at about like three o'clock and I realized I think I'm ready for Sunday. So let's do it. Um, so it's going to be a little different. We're going to stick with our series, our face-to-face -face encounters with Jesus series, sort of. Uh, but I'll explain that in just a second. The thing that's going to be different and unique that I want to, I want to beg for your, uh, understanding and forgiveness for this week's video will probably not have the edits and the slides and all of that stuff that you've gotten used to. Uh, that stuff, it takes a, an awful lot of time to do. And I don't know that I'll be able to do that and also get the video uploaded. So, um, this may just be like an old fashioned class where I'm going to talk and talk you through, um, my content for this week. Uh, and then we'll just kind of see where it goes. But I, I, you may not see any edits this week. I apologize. We'll get back to normal next week um, where we're using graphics and stuff like that. All right, I wanted to start our, our class for this week. Um, I wanted to start by reading uh, a verse that we'll probably go back to again um, in another class. But I wanted to start with it this morning because it kind of fits our face-to-face our -face encounters with Jesus uh, study. I'm going to read... Uh, from Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse uh, 25. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and is the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life. That is a powerful verse. Uh, I'm going to read it again. And which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor they spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass in the field, which today is alive and tomorrow was thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith, therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Um, that is a it's a powerful uh, passage, and it's a passage that um, you're probably familiar with. It's one that, that is used a lot um, for inspirational purposes, but uh, at times I think we can unwittingly um, unleash more anxiety uh, with that verse. And I know that sounds weird. We can release more anxiety because we, we put that verse out into the world. We'll put it on our Facebook pages or we'll put it in, you know, I don't know, other areas where people might see it. Um, but if you don't know how to get there, and if you don't know what, what that really means, um, it can be overwhelming because we don't want to, we don't want to, uh, attach things like faith. So, so we have the passage, oh, you of little faith mixed into a bunch of words about anxiety. And we don't want to attach faith and anxiety. We won't, don't want to feel like anxiety or fear, um, is the result of a lack of faith. But you go into that passage and you can see it pretty clearly, um, so we put that out into the world. Don't be anxious. Don't be worried. Don't be, don't worry. Um, don't be fearful. Uh, and we can inadvertently um, create more fear because of the perception of people hearing it as I'm supposed to have everything figured out. I'm not supposed to be worried. I'm not supposed to be fearful, but I am. Um, our sermon this morning uh, that you're going to hear me preach is on fear. Um, I make a reference. I, I preached a sermon like nine months ago on fear, and this is technically part two. You thought I was kidding about that. You thought I was kidding when I said I had a two-part series that was going to take nine months. Uh, but as you will discover, oh, I was serious. Um, but the idea that we read this passage and, and we read the, the um, opposite of anxiety in it, 
uh, but we don't know how to get there. And so it can create more anxiety for us, I think is really, really true. All of it sounds amazing. Don't be anxious. Don't be worried. Look at the birds. They're taken care of. Look at the lilies of the field. They're taken care of. We're going to be taken care of too. So let's all stand and sing. That's, it's amazing and powerful and awesome and we want it, but how do we get there? Uh, I think God does tell us how. In fact, I think the Bible in its totality is a guide to get there. I think there are numerous places that we could go to in scripture to get us to this type of thinking, to figure out how we go from no fear and no anxiety being desirable to it actually being possible. I think there are a lot of pathways for that. Um, and I think we really need it badly uh, right now. Why do we need this exploration so badly right now? Why am I talking about fear in our sermon this morning? I'm doing that because we went from everything is fine-ish in our culture to shut it down and stay home in what felt like no time at all. So this thing has moved really quickly. We've learned words that we never thought we would know. Um, contact tracing, uh, we're all experts in stuff like this now that we never would have uh, uh, seen otherwise. Um, we've grown accustomed to things that we never thought we would get used to, things like wearing masks, uh, sports leagues aren't operating, schools are scrambling, churches are grasping at everything, and politicians are grandstanding, which is what they tend to do. Um, every system we have that involves people, if it's a complex system, which most of them are, uh, is in disarray. Uh, we're not talking really right now about whether the Cowboys are going to be good this year. We're talking about whether there's going to be a Cowboy season. As I stand here today on July 24th, um, kind of looks like it, but um, I I'm expecting any day for that to change. Uh, I'm expecting the season to be delayed and then more than likely for it to be canceled. The only sense you can make of that is the Lions were going to be good this year, and this is God's way of preventing that from ever actually happening. Um, but to go back to our culture and what we're dealing with, vacation uh, and travel plans have been scrapped and changed. Uh, things that we used to pass the time with are now kind of off limits. Movie theaters, um, big group gatherings, concerts, uh, these things that we used to really um, thrive on, these things that gave us a sense of joy in the world are gone. Um, parents and school districts are scrambling to figure out what to do with kids here in the next few weeks. Uh, some parents are trying to figure out if they've just become homeschool parents involuntarily. Um, parents and teachers are both being lectured by people who don't have school-age kids and who have never been in a classroom in their life on how they're supposed to feel about all of the conversation around education. I think a lot more voices um, need to be amplified of people who have hands-on practical, have been in the classroom experience. It's a lot more complicated than is it dangerous for kids? If the answer is no, go back to school. If the answer is yes, then don't. It's, it's way more complicated than that. If, if you're in a classroom or you're an educator or you're an administrator, you absolutely understand that. Um, popular news outlets in our culture have politicized this pandemic to the point that many of us have absolutely no idea who to trust, what to trust, and what to do next. And if you're skeptical right now because of some of those things, I hear you. I'm with you. I am too. Um, our culture was placed into a very fragile position. And then not surprisingly, we kind of burst right open right in the, right in the middle of it. Um, there are a million other things that I could mention about why we're fearful right now, but you get the idea. Uh, my goal today is to go to just one place of the many places that we could find in God's word to find peace. Um, I'm cheating a little. Let me tell you why I'm cheating a little. Our series is face-to-face -face encounters with Jesus. I'm not technically doing that this morning because I'm preaching. Instead, I'm using my primary text from Daniel because that's where my sermon is coming from, which brings me to my other point that I wanted to mention. Um, those of you who've been in the chapel class with me for a couple of years now, um, you will remember a year ago, we did a, a quarter study on the book of Daniel. Ken and I kind of traded off um, on doing those, those uh, uh, classes. Um, out of those conversations and out of that study that we went on together, uh, I developed the themes for the sermon this morning. Um, so I want to thank you for your participation in that series. Uh, it was vital to helping me figure out uh, how to put together a sermon on this particular uh, subject, on this particular topic. So it, some of it will sound familiar, by the way. We're going through King Nebuchadnezzar. There'll be a couple of points that I mentioned that came directly out of our, our exploration in the chapel class. Um, some of it's going to be new, and it's all going to be packaged in a, in a different way. But um, this morning, you will hear things. If you have been in the chapel class with me, you'll hear things that may be familiar. Um, awesome. 
yes, you've heard some of that stuff before, and, and yes, you were in the room as we worked through it initially. So uh, anyway, with that idea, I, I want to talk about our content and our and fear this morning. Um, in a lot of ways, the first six chapters of the book of Daniel are a study in fear and the various responses to it. Um, uh, for class, for this particular conversation, I want to point to some things that I'm not going to mention in the sermon. The sermon is going to be exclusively focused on King Nebuchadnezzar uh, because he is a very fascinating figure in this book. Uh, but I want to focus for this conversation on a couple of things that we uh, touched on a bit a year ago in the chapel class. So if you remember them, that's amazing. Uh, I'm assuming I'm the only one that kind of remembers what we talked about. You may remember the subject, uh, but but if you remember them, great, awesome, wonderful, um, Today's going to be a review day. Uh, if more than likely, though, you don't remember them, this will be a good opportunity to go back through it. So here are some moments where we see fear in the book of Daniel. Uh, in chapter 1, we see Daniel and his companions taken into Babylonian captivity. Uh, I imagine there was some fear in that transition. I can't imagine um, an invading force uh, coming in and taking me and my friends the people that I, I work with, my associates, I can't imagine being taken into captivity by an invading force. Uh, there was going to be fear in that transition. We don't see that a lot um, in the earliest descriptions here in those first 10 verses or so, but I imagine there was some fear in that transition. Um, in verse 10 specifically, we see fear in the chief eunuch. So Daniel is in captivity and the chief eunuch is uh, the one giving instructions as to what they're going to eat and when they're going to eat. Uh, we see Daniel asking for permission not to eat the king's food because he doesn't want to defile himself. The chief eunuch is afraid that if he allows this, he's going to be killed. He's afraid of the consequences of disobeying a powerful dictator. Man, I can understand that. Uh, I don't want to disobey the eldership at Eastridge, but if they had a habit of torturing and executing people uh, who, who didn't agree with them or who disobeyed them, I imagine I'd be way more afraid of disagreeing. With. As it stands, um, the worst case scenario, if I, if I disobey the elders, I guess, is we're going to have a conversation, um, but I, I would assume execution would be off the table. Uh, as it stands, uh, within the, the East Ridge ministry staff, execution is reserved for only the worst possible offenses, uh, no matter how many times Ray Hughes tries to make it uh, one of our go-to strategies. Uh, despite his, over his objections, we have managed to keep execution uh, kind of off the table with, with standard disobeying. I can't imagine the fear that this chief eunuch is feeling uh, at the idea that if he, if he changes the dietary habits of these prisoners, um, he could be executed for it. Uh, so then uh, we get to the story. We're not going to go too far into that particular exchange. But I want again, these are moments of fear in the book of Daniel. Uh, then we get to the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We're going to touch on this one in the chapel or in the in the sermon this morning we're going to touch on it but again we're, we're focusing on nebuchadnezzar so in the class time this morning i want to focus uh, somewhere a little bit differently um nebuchadnezzar's creation of a statue in his image that um the people are supposed to worship kind of sets the stage uh for the for the shadrach meshach and abednego um story that if you've ever been in vbs or taught vbs you're familiar with uh nebuchadnezzar uh, has made a decree that anyone who failed to bow down and worship this idol was going to be executed. Jason actually left his sermon off last week here in Daniel. With, he talked about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He talked about Daniel. Um, for the record, I was torn on where to go with the sermon this week, and then when I heard him do that, I absolutely wanted to go with Daniel because I felt like it was a little bit of synergy without having to continue his series, which is fantastic. Um, all right, so, so Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar makes a decree that anyone who fails to bow down and worship his idol uh, will be executed. Now, that may not sound like an act motivated in fear, but I believe it is. Uh, I want to explain what I mean. Demanding that people show you respect, demanding that people show you respect is the fruit of a very fragile ego. It's an ego that is rooted in fear. For Nebuchadnezzar, a king an all-powerful king. So what if somebody doesn't bow down? Why does that matter? You have unlimited power. The reason it's a big deal is because it's a challenge. Uh, and he has to respond to it because if he doesn't, somebody else will challenge him too and he's going to look weak. And that would be bad because of all the important people who are at this ceremony of this idol. If he looks bad in front of an audience, 
Um, if he looks weak in front of an audience, his entire kingdom is going to be in jeopardy. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and this is something you'll hear me talk about in the sermon, he may look frightening on the outside, but inside, all of his actions, to me, scream fragile ego rooted in fear. Um, pay attention to the sermon today, and I think you'll understand why I say that. So then it happens. The Chaldeans, uh, the king's inner circle of magicians and enchanters who have a personal vendetta um, against these Jewish boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, they tattletale. Like, there's a tattletale scene in this, in this exchange. They go to the king, and they say, uh, you said, king, you remember when you said that if anyone doesn't bow down that they would be executed? Do you remember when you said that? And, and he says, yes, I remember. He said, well, guess what? These, these three didn't bow down when you said to bow down at all the horns and the trumpets and the lyres. Uh, and so, of course, they're referring to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, tattletelling. It's Old Testament. It's been going on for a long time. The Chaldeans, by the way, are also likely driven by jealousy, uh, which is a fear that you don't measure up and someone else's success is proof of that. I'm going to say that again because I think it's important. If you've ever struggled with jealousy, if you're struggling with jealousy right now, there's fear in jealousy. There is fear in jealousy. Jealousy is a fear that you don't measure up and someone else's success is proof. And as soon as everybody else sees it, they're going to know you're a fraud. That's what jealousy is. So again, it's fear. So Nebuchadnezzar is furious in this exchange, which I can also, uh, is also rooted in fear. I can argue is also rooted in fear. Um, we'll go back to that in the sermon. Uh, so Nebuchadnezzar asked the kids, is it true? Um, I keep calling them the kids because, I mean, they're young. They're young. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are young. Um, he then gives them a second chance, a chance to go back on their, their refusal to obey. Again, I'm going to go into that in the sermon as well. But this entire setup, the golden statue, the decree to worship it, the tattletelling, uh, the giving them a second chance, it is all a study in fear. It really and truly is. Specifically, it's a study in how to respond to fear in a horrifying way. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar deals in extremes. He is not a stable person. You're going to hear me talk about that a lot this morning in, in the sermon. But stable is a good word for these Jewish boys. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So is courageous. They are given a way out of the fiery furnace. They just have to bow down. They've been confronted with their misdeed. And all they have to do now is bow. Nebuchadnezzar can't touch their hearts. God will understand, won't he? Uh, just bow down. Just bow. Fake it. I don't know, bow, and then it all ends, right? That would be a pathway forward for a lot of us. Uh, that is not the pathway forward for these boys. Uh, they respond in verse 16, and I wanted to focus on that because that's our primary takeaway today. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. I don't know what they were thinking. Uh, I don't know what they were feeling, but we get a picture here of fearlessness. But I want to be careful. There are bold words coming from these boys, but fear is an internal experience. Uh, what we see here is action, not feeling. Um, these boys were facing execution by being burned alive. Unless they weren't human, I imagine they were feeling some degree of fear. What they showed was not fearlessness. It was courage. There's a huge difference in those two things. So what's the difference? Uh, fearlessness means a lack of fear, obviously. I don't see fearlessness as being much of a goal. Um, and I don't have some insane respect level for people who possess fearlessness. Fearlessness just means you're not afraid. Uh, maybe you're not afraid because you have no idea what you're up against. Maybe your fearlessness is actually ignorance. Um, we had a plumber at our house a couple of weeks ago, uh, who had to cut a hole in the wall to get to a pipe that was leaking. When he did, there was a copperhead coiled up in the wall where he was working. It was, it was this frightening moment. Um, dude reached in and just went to that pipe like that copperhead wasn't even there. It was the most fearless thing I have ever seen. Um, and the only reason he felt it's because he didn't see the copperhead. He had no idea that there was a coiled up copperhead in the wall. Uh, when he saw it, he yelled like a girl. Uh, and then he said, one of my favorite quotes ever, he said, I just deal with pipes, you're gonna have to deal with that. Uh, which, of course, I did in the manliest way possible. I looked at April and I said, go get the snake grabber. 
We have a snake grabber because we live in a jungle. Um, she comes back with the snake grabber, the big snake grabber pole. And I said, I'll go grab that snake. And then I kind of took, took a step back. And I watched as my wife then went and, and did exactly that. She went and grabbed the snake. Um, we have an agreement. For those of you who know my family, you'll know that what I'm saying is true. My wife is a farmer. I'm a guy who lives on a farm. There's a very big difference in those two things. Uh, the idea, though, is that fearlessness is a lack of fear, um, but that fearlessness doesn't necessarily mean what it appears. Uh, that's the whole point of the copperhead in the wall conversation. So fearlessness is a lack of fear, but courage is action in the face of fear. That I respect a great deal. Um, I've got two sons. Uh, I tell them all the time, I don't need them to be fearless. I need them to be courageous. Um, courageous means I, I feel fear. I, I, I don't deny the fact that I experience the feelings of fear, but I act anyway. Fearlessness is I have no fear. Courage is I act in the face of fear. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were courageous. Um, to me, their story reads, again, the detail, uh, they're facing execution by being burned alive. I can't imagine there wasn't some fear in that. Um, so what did they say? They said, with boldness, our God will deliver us. But that's not all they said. Uh, the second part of their response is really important. Um, to me, it's a model of courage that exemplifies how we're supposed to handle fear in our own lives. Uh, they say, the end of verse 17, he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But beginning in verse 18, they say this. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. But if not. They said, our God will deliver us. But if he doesn't, we still won't compromise who we are. Our God will deliver us. But if he doesn't, his plans are perfect and they're bigger than our understanding. America in 2020. God will save us from this nightmare. But if he doesn't, we will still believe. I think that's courage. Uh, you probably know uh, the rest of their story. Nebuchadnezzar's enraged, and we're going to cover a bunch of this stuff um, uh, in the sermon this morning. Um, but I do want to mention just a couple quick things as we, we close things out. Uh, first of all, um, I want to mention that uh, there are some specific moments uh, some specific points that I'll give you in the sermon about managing our fear, about identifying it and then what we're supposed to do with it. And then the end of, of Daniel 4 is where we're really going to get into that confrontation. Um, but I have a few quick thoughts about the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that you're not going to hear in the sermon. And I think that they will be important for us this morning. One, uh, God's people will be confronted uh, by the idols of this world. Um, and this, it's okay to experience fear in that. Um, two, God's people will be challenged to worship the idols of this world. Um, you know what's interesting? Right now, our culture is idolizing fear and panic. Uh, we've done that forever, sort of, but right now, it's probably more prominent than I've ever seen it, largely because we have a, a media structure, and I, kn I know I go to this well a lot, but it's because I really believe it. We have a media structure that has been irrelevant, um, largely, when things are calm, the media is kind of irrelevant. Uh, the only time the media is relevant is when there is sheer panic and chaos. And so there's a vested interest in creating sheer panic and chaos. Um, we need to remember as Christians that when our culture idolizes fear and panic, we don't. Um, we're pressured to do the same. But I believe our culture idolizes fear and panic, and, and I believe it's our job not to. Uh, finally, my third point is that God's people can be confident that the Lord is with them no matter what happens um, in this world. God shows up. He always shows up. That's spelled out in the response from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They know God will show up, and their words indicate they recognize that God may not show up in the way that they're hoping. But uh, the fact that he'll show up is enough for them. Uh, that truth brings me hope. I, I hope it does for you as well. Um, you're going to hear me say at the end of class or at the end of the sermon this morning um, to listen to the voice of the Lord rather than the voice of fear. Uh, I want to encourage you chapel class this morning to do the same. Um, our culture that we're living in right now is peddling in fear and is um, glorifying fear in a way that, that doesn't lead to a healthy place. Uh, our job this morning as Christians to get to that place we started in Matthew, to get to that place where we're not anxious, where we don't worry, 
to get to that place. Um, I think we need to remember that true courage in the face of fear is recognizing that God's in control um, and then recognizing that whatever that looks like, we trust it, we have faith in it, and we know that God always shows up. Um, we don't have to be driving the boat and he doesn't have to give us an itinerary ahead of time to trust the fact that God is going to show up. So that is my, my prayer for you this morning, Easter Shop class. I apologize again for the kind of thrown together nature of this morning's class. I didn't want you to not have content uh, because it is valuable and important to me to continue to connect with you this way. Um, but I had not planned on doing anything because of the, of the sermon. Um, but, but as the week would work out, I, I had some time this afternoon. Um, so a lot of what we did this morning was stuff that I kind of cut from the sermon um, that made apparently a way longer video than I could have possibly imagined. I thought this was going to be 10 minutes. I think I'm looking at like 25 now. Um, I have a problem with that. Uh, until next time, Easter Chapel class, I love you. I miss you. Next week, I will be back with our regularly edited slides and stuff video. Uh, but bear with me for this week. Uh, hopefully, I, you will join me in the sermon this morning, and I will see you very, very soon.